The Ford government is taking aim at car thieves, announcing stiff new penalties for those caught and convicted. And we're following developing news downtown. This is where a cyclist has been hit by a vehicle near Dundas and McCall. And the Israeli flag is raised at City Hall. Mayor Olivia Chow did not attend the ceremony this morning. Good afternoon and welcome to CP24 Live at Noon. I'm Bakari Savage. And I'm Lena Latifat. Thank you for joining us. We begin this hour with breaking news. One person has been taken to hospital with life-threatening injuries after a two-vehicle collision in Scarborough. It, this is a live look at the scene near Kingston Road in Midland, and police say that one of the vehicles rolled over and it hit a school bus. No children were on the bus at the time. There are road closures in the area. The cause of the collision, that's still under investigation. And a cyclist is in hospital after being hit by a vehicle downtown. The collision happened just before 11 o'clock this morning at Dundas and McCall. Paramedics say that a woman suffered serious injuries and police say that the driver did remain at the scene. There's no word yet if charges will be laid. Also making news, the province is planning to make changes to the Highway Traffic Act aimed at cracking down on car thieves. A new legislation would attach a 10-year driver's license suspension to a first conviction for auto thefts involving violence, the use of a weapon, or where financial gain was the motive. And the suspension could extend to 15 years for a second offense and a lifetime driving ban for a third. Putting our foot down on auto theft is our priority, and no Ontarian deserves to have their vehicle stolen. And under the leadership of Premier Ford, we're taking every step to ensure that if you steal a car, you will be punished to the fullest extent of the law. And joining us now with analysis on this new legislation is CB24's crime analyst Steve Ryan. So the big question, Steve, is this going to work? Well, it's something, Lena. It is provincial legislation at the end of the day. Um, but at least the province is trying to do something to, to deter uh, those would-be auto thieves who um, feel free to steal cars uh, throughout the province and carjack cars. The police services throughout the province have spent millions of dollars on successful projects disrupting and dismantling a lot of organized crime uh, groups that have been profiting off of uh, stealing uh, motor vehicles and sending, sending them overseas. Now, that's a federal law. Theft over or theft under $5,000 is for the vehicle. If it's a carjacking, it's a robbery. And many police chiefs that I've spoken with over the past 18 months or so, and mayors as well, Mayor Brown from uh, Brampton comes to mind, they've been calling on the feds to toughen the sentences when it comes to convictions and strengthening the borders as well to prevent cars from being easily transported over the borders and offshore onto other countries where these cars are being sold for big money. So the, the, it is provincial legislation, but the province is saying that they're going to do their part if, in fact, the feds aren't going to step up and toughen sentencing to deter others from committing these criminal offenses. The province is going to impose tough suspensions uh, provincially for those who are convicted of the federal crime. So you're convicted of a federal crime, you get a provincial license suspension, and that'll just go up in years, the more times you were convicted. Uh, here is exactly how it's going to happen. We heard from the Minister of Transportation earlier on. Just know what he says. This includes a lifetime license suspension for convicted auto thieves from ever driving again upon a third conviction. With 10 to 15 year suspensions for first and second convictions after serving sentences under the criminal code. This will apply to convictions that include aggravating factors like violence, use of a weapon, use of force, threat, or pursuit of financial gain. Driving is a privilege, not a right. If you're shameful enough to prey on other members of the community for your own reckless gain, you'll lose that privilege. Now, again, yes, this is provincial legislation. But what happens, Alina Bakari, is it snowballs. If you were driving under suspension and you were investigated by the police while you were driving a vehicle, oftentimes when you have no license, you have no insurance. And those fines are pretty stiff. And you can do provincial time in a provincial institution if, in fact, you are uh, convicted of having no license and no insurance. So what happens is you just snowball into this world of no control. So oftentimes the provincial legislation could be a lot tougher than the federal legislation. So this does act as a deterrent. It doesn't correct the criminal behavior that's going on, 
but it might give thieves a second thought when they go to commit this criminal offense that uh, they might be running the risk of being caught without a license, and uh, that could be more of a penalty than the federal offense, believe it or not. All right, Steve Ryan, live in our newsroom. Thanks so much, Steve. And coming up at 12.15, in just a few minutes, Transportation Minister Pravneet Sarkaria will join us live here in studio to talk more about this legislation. So stay with us for that conversation. The Israeli flag was raised at City Hall today despite tensions over the war in Gaza. And the flag is being flown to recognize Israel's Independence Day. It was raised after the city approved a request to fly it, which was made by the Consulate General of Israel in Toronto. The flag has traditionally been flown at City Hall in the past, but some protesters have called for the event to be canceled this year. What you're seeing on the streets of Toronto is not the real Toronto. They do not represent this great city that welcomes the world and is a great friend of Israel. People come here from all over the world to escape conflict zones and hate. They come here to Toronto. I know hate when I see it, and I can tell you these hate rallies on the seats of Toronto are not charter protected. As Torontonians, our connections with Israel have never been stronger. Tens of thousands of Torontonians, Torontonians visit Israel every year. And thousands more bought property there. And Mayor Olivia Chow was in at the flag raising ceremony and spoke to reporters about why she decided not to attend. The decision is not mine or city council. Uh, city protocol office was delegated the power to run the flag raising program in 1999. Um, and I generally don't go to flag raising events uh, for countries uh, because there are quite a lot of them. And um, I, I think it's a bit divisive because there's a war going on in the Middle East and people are protesting every weekend. Demonstrators gathered in Nathan Phillips Square this morning to rally against the Israeli flag being raised. Here's a look at that. They say that the event shows disregard for the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza. I am embarrassed because we should all be, uh, there are so many Palestinians that live amongst us, um, the entire Arab community that has uh, relatives in, that have lost relatives uh, in Gaza that are actively losing relatives in Gaza as we speak, um, and to raise the flag of the people that are causing this harm uh, is, I have no words for it, it's unconscionable. And Premier Ford released a statement marking Israeli Independence Day, and that reads in part, from the beginning, Ontario and Israel have had a deep and lasting connection, united by bonds of family, friendship, trade, and shared values. Ontario's diverse Jewish community has helped strengthen these bonds in the process, contributing to so much of our province's cultural, religious, and social vibrancy. Ontario continues to benefit from these close and important ties. Right now, let's go live to Port Colborne. This is where Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Premier Doug Ford are making an automotive announcement. Uh, more companies here, and I know more companies are on their way. Together, we have welcomed new battery plants in Alliston, St. Thomas, and Windsor. And with these anchor investments in battery plants, we're starting to see the EV supply chain fill out in more communities. Helping to create jobs and support local economies across the province, We've seen major investments from parts and component producers in Loyalist Township, in Brampton, in Brantford, and now in Col Col uh, Port Colburn. And we're seeing auto manufacturers add second and third shifts to plants in Oshawa and Ingersoll as they retool to manufacture EVs. We're so proud that Ontario is now the only place in North America that the six largest automakers call home. Companies of all sizes are investing in our province because of our dependable supply chains, our world-class workforce, as the Prime Minister mentioned, and our transportation infrastructure. Companies are coming here because of our competitive business environment, because of the work we've done to cut red tape by a billion dollars, to reduce the cost of electricity between 15 and 17%, and keep taxes low. Since taking office nearly six years ago, 
our government has never, ever raised a tax on people or businesses. We've seen revenue growth from companies like, like Asahi Kasai and other companies that drive revenues up. We have 700,000 people that are working today that were not working six years ago. In fact, we've reduced taxes for people and taken the burden off the backs of businesses by $8 billion each and every year. And folks, here in Ontario, we're going to keep working hard to create the environment and the conditions for companies like Asahi Kase to thrive, prosper and grow. We're going to keep the momentum going, attracting more EV investments and creating good paying jobs with bigger paychecks in every part of our province. Once again, thank you for your investment and for your confidence in our province and our country and most importantly, our workers. Thank you to everyone for joining us today and may God bless the people of Ontario. Now I'll hand it over to the Canadians number one sales Salesperson, <laughs> Minister Champagne. These these guys are. He's like the energy energizer bunny. I call him. He is going. Okay, all just over listening to, place, to Ontario's Premier Doug Ford making an announcement alongside yeah. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in Port Colborne this afternoon, announcing a plan to set up a new battery plant in Niagara Region. This is, of course, going to help the auto industry. We're going to have much more on that throughout the day. Well, another Mississauga mayoral by election debate took place last night. Even though the perceived front runner. Dropped out. The debate was held at the University of Toronto's Mississauga campus. I should note, I was the moderator. It was hosted by More Homes Mississauga, and housing was really the focus last night. Deepika the Merla and Alvin Tejo participated, but frontrunner Carolyn Parrish was a no-show. She also announced she will not be taking part in any other debates. We are hearing from her today. Yeah, a statement from Parrish this morning reads in part, quote, we deeply regret that a new style of politics has emerged in this race. It's disheartening to watch. These actions have led to threats against my colleague and now against me. In light of these circumstances, I've made the difficult decision to refrain from participating in debates to prioritize the safety of myself and my colleague. My focus remains on continuing with my campaign and meeting with the residents of Mississauga. This is the third largest city in Ontario. They deserve candidates who are uh, willing and open to meet with the media, to talk to residents and voters about their priorities and their issues. I think it's a little cowardly to run away from that. And, you know, based on performance of previous debates and things that they've said in the past, you know, that's exactly why we need to be more on top of questioning them and, and what they stand for. Voters trust her. I will be attending every single debate because I believe that voters deserve to hear directly from candidates. I like her for, um, she's a straight, down-to-earth person. Mm -hmm. um, she's very easy to speak to. Uh, she gives you a straight answer. As a front-runner, I think she almost has an obligation to participate. I'd like to know her reasoning, but playing it safe, perhaps? I don't know. I wanted to see what she stood for now. She wasn't always the most popular in other fields years ago, a little bit outspoken, so I was... Anxious to hear her tonight. And Parrish came under criticism for comments that she made at a debate last week about refugees and transgender people. And we should note we've asked Carolyn Parrish to come on the show. We're still waiting for a response. Coming up next on CB24 Live at Noon, a potential breakthrough in ALS research made right here in Ontario. We'll have more on what that means on the path to a possible cure. We have more now on our top story. The province announcing plans to further crack down on auto theft today. And joining us live on CB24 now is Ontario Transportation Minister Prabhmeet Sarkaria. Minister, thank you for joining us. Auto theft, uh, a big problem, we know this. Is what you've introduced a big enough deterrent for auto theft criminals, though? We're talking about people who are engaging in violent, organized crime. Do they care about having their driver's license suspended? Why do you think this is going to work? Well, I think it's a, about a suite of, of tools that we have that we at our disposal that we're, we're using right now. It's about uh, making sure from a provincial perspective as a government that, you know, we don't control the criminal code of uh, Canada where we have called repeatedly on the federal government for stiffer penalties, uh, keep these people at NGL behind bars. But from our perspective, uh, we believe and talking to many people who wake up in their morning and don't have a, a car in their driveway, we need to do whatever, whatever we can within our purview as a provincial government 
to undertake uh, tougher penalties. And so we will lead the nation in ensuring that anyone that is stealing a vehicle, whether it be for, th for profit uh, or for instances with aggravating factors such as uh, guns or assault, um, that they uh, aren't able to drive for, for 10 years uh, post-conviction. You, you touched on this. From an enforcement perspective, you really are limited in terms of what you can do. You can't keep, all, keep people behind bars for longer, as you noted. That falls on the federal government. Is this as far as you could go, Minister? Well, this is um, absolutely one of the tools. So where it's uh, you know over 50 to $100 million in investments that we put into police forces on special task force, $18 million grant towards a lot of our policing to ensure that they can uh, buy the new technologies, uh, hire more people directed right at uh, auto theft. Uh, from our perspective, you know, a driver's license uh, uh, is a privilege. It's not a right. And we know how important it is to people. And so one of the ways to combat that is to take that, to take that away from them and for them to know that if they're going to, you know, engage in such activity, uh, that the Ontario government, with whatever power that we have, will come in full force and ensure that uh, that our right is taken away from you. And, and, and that's what we're, we're seeing here today. You know, I uh, talk to many of my neighbors who've had their cars stolen. We yeah. see uh, break and enters increased by over 400 percent just last year in Toronto. So it's a real issue facing a lot of families. It is a real issue. And there's so many people who might be watching this thinking, I don't care how the government gets there. I just want this taken care of. And one of the ways to do that is increased enforcement. So what does that plan look like? Are you planning on increasing enforcement? Oh, no, absolutely. We have, uh, whether it be from uh, officers on the ground, special task forces between uh, the OPP, York, Peel region, some of the hardest hit areas, just those Toronto, York and Peel last year had 25,000 cars stolen, over a billion dollars to the cost of this province. Uh, we put $50 million uh, into combating auto theft. We put over $253 million into gun gang violence pre prevention programs uh, and, and enforcement, uh, as well as making sure on the judicial side, having the Crown pro prosecutors and sp special enforcement teams. But ultimately, we also need the federal government to step up here and put stiffer penalties behind a lot of these people. But, you know, we're going to take your license away if you uh, engage in this sort of activity and face uh, lifetime suspensions as well if you engage in, in multiple occasions. I, I want to talk to you about the other big headline. Everybody's talking about auto theft, but you're also tabling legislation to tackle stunt driving in this province. Stiffer penalties are coming. Tell me why. Absolutely. We had 11,000 roadside suspensions last year on stunt driving and street racing. Uh, so we know this is an issue on our roads. Uh, and one of the, the ways to do that, once again, is to uh, enforce higher penalties on those individuals. So speeding over 50 kilometers of the posted limit is unacceptable. We need to keep our roads safe. There's a lot of people on our roads uh, that want to get, everybody deserves to get home uh, safe. And so if you're contravening that uh, law, if you're contravening um, those uh, safety, putting other people's lives at risk, we want to come down on you hard. So uh, we've introduced a, a one-year automatic suspension on the first, three years on the second, and lifetime upon a third conviction of uh, either street racing or upon uh, uh, stunt driving. Minister Prabhmeet Sarkaria, thank you for your time here on CP24. We appreciate this. Thank you so much for having me. And with that, Bakari, I'll send it back to you. All right, thanks a lot, Lena. Well, researchers at Western University in London say that they found a pathway to potentially cure ALS. It relates to the targeting of the interaction between two proteins that could halt or fully reverse the disease's progression. Researchers discovered that when the proteins interact with each other, the toxicity of the ALS-causing protein is removed. That significantly reduces damage to the nerve cell and prevents it, its death. It'll be at least three years before human trials can begin. A $10 million donation from the Intermerty Foundation is set to fund and accelerate the research. Well, coming up next on CP24 Live at Noon, how a new trailer could help improve health literacy across the country. We're going to have those details in moments. A new initiative is being launched to help promote health literacy all across the country in the form of a trailer. At Global Medics, Raul Singh and Rupa Bari, GM of Haley in Canada, joins us live on CB24 to explain. Thank you both for being with us this afternoon. Tell us more about this new trailer and all the people you think it may help. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, I'm with Halion, and we make over-the-counter health products. And we make things you probably have in your medicine cabinets today. Sensodyne, Centrum, Advil, and of course, the, uh, the Canadian favorite, Buckley's. And what we're launching here today is a Halion health trailer. We're really looking forward to bringing self-care health products, health services, and health education to people who are in need where they need it most.
So let's get on the trailer and, and take a look. The idea is to deliver aid right into the community. And you think of all the folks that can't necessarily make it to clinics or make it to food banks. So this is the trailer inside and you can see all the interesting shelving that we've got. We've even got refrigeration down at the end and it's just filled with products. And we're gonna take it into different communities and get the aid out. And Raul, wow. there's a real focus on helping marginalized communities. Yeah, no, look, it's massive, because if you look at this and how it impacts the whole healthcare system, this is children's Advil, right? This is so important to be able to get to parents so that they can give it to their kids when they become symptomatic, because if they can treat those symptoms early on, those kids don't end up in hospital, they're not overwhelming the system. And it's that type of healthcare literacy, especially for newcomers and refugees, they can't really manage the system. They're prohibited from products like this. And if we can get this aid in, thanks to our friends at Halion, this is the right aid and it's going to help a lot of people. Yeah, I want to talk more about those people. What, what, first of all, what kind of work went into setting up a trailer like that? And where do you hope to go? Tell us about the communities you hope to serve. Rupa, we'll let you take this one. Yeah, sure. So, you know, we actually have been partnering with Global Medic over the course of the past year <laughs> and serving the community in this way, but we were doing so in pop-up clinics. And we found that there is such a deep need that we wanted to invest in, in actually doing this, um, you know, in a more dedicated fashion, which is why we have the trailer. And Global Medic will be leading the program implementation. So I'll let Rahul take you through a little bit about what the trailer can offer. Yes, yeah, so you can imagine all the clinics we'd go to, homeless encampments, places where newcomers are, refugees, asylum seekers. This trailer will actually show up in some of our priority neighborhoods as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to be able to use those fridges to bring milk into communities, just to be able to bring yeah. these over-counter products in to communities that wouldn't normally be able to get them. Like this is, we're so proud to be able to do this. Raul, what if there's a community who wants that kind of help and, and they want to reach out to you? How do you get to decide <coughs> where you go? Well, listen, if, if people are watching your show right now and they want this type of assistance, yeah. just reach out to us at globalmedic.ca. We've got a, a team of uh, coordinators putting this together. I want this trailer rolling across the GTA every day if possible and getting aid out. We know that there's so many people in our community in need and we want to help them. And then we're grateful to our friends at Haleon for giving us the tools, not only the product, but the delivery item as well in the, in the trailer. Okay. <laughs> Health Literacy with Global Medics Royal Singh and Rupa Bari, GM of Halion Canada. Thank you. Thanks so much for this. And coming up next on CB24 Live at Noon, we continue to follow a developing situation out of Scarborough. That is where two people have been taken to hospital following a collision near Kingston Road in Midland. Stay with us for the latest. Two people are injured following a crash in Scarborough, one of them critically. We are following developing news from downtown Toronto where a cyclist has been hit by a vehicle near Dundas and McCall. This is a live shot. And the Ford government is taking aim at car thieves, announcing stiff new penalties for those caught and convicted. Good afternoon and welcome to CP24 Live at Noon. I'm Lena Latifat. And I'm Bakari Savage. Two people, two people have been taken to hospital after a two-vehicle collision in Scarborough. Chopper 24 was over the scene moments ago near Kingston Road in Midland. We now have images from the ground. Here's what we know. A man was taken to hospital in serious condition while a woman suffered life-threatening injuries. Police say one of the vehicles rolled over and hit this school bus. You can see that damage. No kids were on the bus at the time, and there are road closures in the area. You can see from our shot, the area has been cordoned off. The cause of this collision under investigation, and no word yet if charges will be laid. So keep it here on CP24. To another developing story now, a cyclist in hospital after being hit by a vehicle downtown. Yeah, the collision happened just before 11 o'clock this morning at Dundas and McCall. This is a live look at the area. So paramedics say a woman suffered serious injuries and police say that the driver did stay at the scene. There's no word yet if charges will be laid. You can see that this area has been cordoned off. 
Also making news, the province is planning to make changes to the Highway Traffic Act aimed at cracking down on car thieves. New legislation would attach a 10-year driver's license suspension to a first conviction for auto thefts involving violence, the use of a weapon, or where financial gain was the motive. That suspension could extend to 15 years for a second offense and a lifetime driving ban for a third. While Ontario has some of the safest roads in North America, in 2022, almost 11,000 immediate roadside license suspensions were issued for street racing or stunt driving, putting countless lives at risk. That is why our legislation would also amend the Highway Traffic Act, closing a loophole to ensure that anyone convicted of stunt driving faces a mandatory minimum license suspension. This will mean at least one year suspension on the first offense, three years for the second, and an indefinite suspension upon third conviction. And joining us now with more on this legislation is our crime analyst, Steve Ryan. As Steve, I just had the chance to sit down with the minister and ask him a few questions. My first was, is this a big enough deterrent for auto theft criminals? Would they care about having their driver's license suspended? What do you think? Yeah, I think anything that uh, any of our governments can do to act as a deterrent is a step in the positive direction. So, yes, this is provincial legislation that will see somebody who's convicted of the uh, first offense of either stealing a car or a carjacking, have a license suspension for 10 years, then it'll go to 15 years for a second say, uh, conviction and a lifetime suspension for a third conviction. Will it affect car thieves? It may deter the odd car thief from wanting to get into that sort of industry, if you will, because if you lose your license, you can just your, your life can just spiral out of control when it comes to any sort of transportation, because if the police run your license plate, if you're the registered owner of the vehicle, or they investigate you as a driver of a car on our highways and you come back as under suspension, it's a pretty steep fine. And what happens when your license is suspension is suspended rather is you do not have car insurance. And that spirals even more. So you have stiff fines to pay. If you don't pay those fines, you can be uh, incarcerated for a period of less than two years. And oftentimes that is more of a sentence uh, than you would get if you were convicted of a, a criminal offense. So will it act as a deterrent? Yes. Does more need to be done with regards to the federal government? Yes, we've heard from many police chiefs that I've spoken with over the last 18 months and our political leaders. Patrick Brown comes to mind from Brampton, and they are calling on the feds to stiffen the sentencing of those that are convicted of stealing cars, whether it be through a, a theft of auto or carjacking. Repeat offenders, they want uh, har harsher sentences as well, and the uh, police services are calling on the uh, feds to strengthen the borders so that cars don't get easily transported across the border. So it is a federal problem, but here in the province of Ontario, the government has taken a step forward, tabling this legislation on Thursday, putting these uh, license suspensions into place. So every little bit counts when it comes as a deterrent. I would never say that there is not enough deterrence out there, and uh, this would be one of the big ones if, in fact, this uh, legislation is passed come this Thursday. Here's more from the Solicitor General, who we heard from earlier today. Let's listen. Putting our foot down on auto theft is our priority, and no Ontarian deserves to have their vehicle stolen. And under the leadership of Premier Ford, we're taking every step to ensure that if you steal a car, you will be punished to the fullest extent of the law. So both offenses are uh, equally as serious. A carjacking obviously has the ability to paralyze a community if, in fact, they're just random acts. It may stop a community member from going about their day-to-day -day lives for fear that they might be the next victim. Now, you have a car that's taken out of a parking lot or out of your driveway. That affects a community as well, and it affects all of us when it comes to finances because insurance companies oftentimes are in, well, they're in the business of making money, let's face it. And if many cars are being stolen and not recovered, they have to pay off those costs. And at the end of the day, we all pay for that. So it is not a victimless crime. So I think, personally, Lena, if you're asking me, this is a step in the right direction, a positive step uh, for the provincial government to at least do something and send a message to the uh, people in the province of Ontario that uh, they are taking this crime seriously and they are doing what they can, although their hands are tied provincially, they're doing what they can to instill uh, in deterrence to help minimize this uh, crime from occurring as often as we're seeing it now. All right. CB24's crime analyst, Steve Ryan, always good to get your insights. Thank you, Steve. All right, let's get a check on the roads with traffic specialist Agile NTIA Blocks, 1237, 20 degrees out there. Adj.
Oh, good afternoon, Bakari and Lena. Yeah, we are dealing with some uh, major issues impacting the commute this hour. On the 401, if you're traveling on the eastbound side, this is just past the Allen. It is only the left shoulder getting by because of this multi-vehicle collision where a number of vehicles collided with each other. So this is what's creating that delay. You can probably bail and get into those transfer lanes that take you to the collectors because collectors are actually moving very well. There is a delay. It's quite a big. It's severe. It does extend from about Martin Grove. So, again, you're going to have to pack a bit of patience. Now, southbound on the Don Valley Parkway. Oh, here they are. This is a southbound DVP on the approach to Don Mills. A slow-moving grass-cutting crew. They're back at it again. They were there yesterday as well. And this is creating quite a slowdown on the approach to Don Mills. Slowdowns from up before York Mills, but some good news. On the QEW Toronto bound on the downside of the Burlington Skyway, uh, we were dealing with a collision. It was in the left lane. The problem's cleared. Outside of camera view, very serious collision involving a cyclist that was struck in Scarborough on Kingston Road in Midland. And we still have that uh, stretch of a Dundas eastbound shutdown at McCall. That was for another collision this morning involving a cyclist. I'll send it back to you. The CP24 traffic report is brought to you by CapitalDirect.ca. The Israeli flag was raised at City Hall today despite tensions over the war in Gaza. And the flag is being flown to recognize Israel's independence day. It was raised after the city approved a request to fly it, which was made by the Consulate General of Israel in Toronto. And the flag has traditionally been flown at City Hall in the past, but some protesters have called for the event to be canceled this year. Toronto will never waver from its unshakable commitment to Israel. But there is work to be done. We will continue to vigorously fight anti-Semitism in all its forms, disrupt and fight back against the disinformation and conspiracy theories that Israel and get the hate rallies off our streets, take down that hateful encampment at, at uh, the University of Toronto and ensure Toronto remains a safe place where the Jewish community and all residents can always call home and always flourish. Mayor Olivia Chow was not at the flag raising ceremony and she spoke to reporters about why she decided not to attend. It's pretty clear there's there's been demonstrations since October every weekend um, and emotions are very high and I think it's important that we um, hear each other, be empathetic. So here's video of demonstrators who gathered in Nathan Phillips Square this morning to rally against the Israeli flag being raised. They say that the event shows disregard for the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza. I am embarrassed because we should all be, uh, there are so many Palestinians that live amongst us, um, the entire Arab community that has uh, relatives in, that have lost relatives uh, in Gaza, that are actively losing relatives in Gaza as we speak, um, and to raise the flag of the people that are causing this harm uh, is... There, I have no words for it. It's unconscionable. Premier Ford released a statement marking Israeli independence. It reads in part, quote, from the beginning, Ontario and Israel have had a deep and lasting connection united by bonds of family, friendship, trade and shared values. Ontario's diverse Jewish community has helped strengthen these bonds in the process, contributing to so much of our province's cultural, religious and social vibrancy. Ontario continues to benefit from these close and important ties. As Israel marks its 76th Independence Day, Palestinians will commemorate the 76th anniversary of the Nakba tomorrow, the Arabic word for catastrophe. More than 700,000 Palestinians fled or were driven from their homes before and during the 1948 Arab-Israeli war that followed Israel's creation. Israel refused to allow them to return after the war, creating a permanent refugee community that has since grown to over 6 million people. And Toronto Mayor Olivia Chow spoke earlier about a new report highlighting the city being $26 billion short when it comes to the city's infrastructure. Libraries, for example, is short $3 million. Parks and Recreation, $27 million. The transit <clears throat> is short $2.3 billion. That's a huge amount of money. Four out of ten of the city infrastructure uh, are categorized as poor or very poor in terms of its performances. That means they're falling apart literally in front of our eyes and require replacement so they could operate. 
And the longer we wait to fix it, the more it will cost. The new report is required by the province and lists the growing needs of Toronto's facilities, fleet and equipment. Well, coming up next on CP24 Live at noon, a multi-million dollar renovation of Scotiabank Arena enters a new phase. Those details are after the break. There's a renewed call for the provincial government to develop an updated strategy when it comes to alcohol. Camille Kenville is the CEO of the Canadian Mental Health Association's Ontario Division and joins us live with more. Camille, why is this necessary? Well, the province is expanding the accessibility of alcohol, and it is now more increasingly important that we have the ability to have a strategy that will look after people who unfortunately suffer harm from alcohol use. And um, we ideally are doing this with the provincial government. We are very anxious to work with them on this, and I have... Uh, 12 uh, provincial colleagues uh, running organizations who are joining the call for this work to begin. And, you know, speaking of, why is this the responsibility of the province? What about personal accountability? Well, clearly there is personal accountability around any kind of substance use, but we know that uh, addictions are very real in society. And we also know that Increased access for alcohol use also leads to increased consumption. And the province spends $7 billion a year managing the health-related effects of alcohol use, including everything from nine different types of cancers to issues with the justice system uh, and everything in between. So we think this strategy is coming, uh, the notion of building a strategy is coming at a very good time as we see um, more and more availability of alcohol. Let's talk about specific recommendations here to help deal with this. So uh, uh, there would be a number of recommendations. And quite honestly, the, the really good news in, in a group of uh, province-wide health organizations coming together is that we're all going to take a different uh, approach and a different recommendation to build a strategy as it relates to the particular areas of responsibility each of us has. So with respect to mental health and addictions, where we come from, uh, it is there are multiple recommendations that we would have. Uh, as as uh, you can imagine, people become in conflict with the law um, when they uh, misuse substances, including alcohol. So we would have a number of recommendations there. And there would be a number of, frankly, just health-related recommendations and recommendations around ensuring that there is less of a uh, human toll for those who are attached by family or friendship with someone who is uh, uh, using alcohol to excess. And as this is navigated, what is, what is your message to the community? Well, to the community, of course, we are always uh, hopeful that people uh, drink in moderation, that they're aware of the risks, that they drink responsibly. And our message to the provincial government is we would love to work with you and we would love to work uh, on behalf of all of our, our citizens across the province to be able to build something that works in everyone's best interests, including the provincial government. And um, I think uh, it's really, this should be seen as being supportive of decisions that they've made and us using our voice to be able to, to share uh, not just a concern, but hopefully come to the table with solutions as well. Camille Kenville, CEO of the Canadian Mental Health Association's Ontario Division. Thank you. Thank you. Well, MLSC has began their second phase of a multi-million dollar renovation of Scotiabank Arena. The upgrades, which are set to be completed by October, will include a complete design makeover of the 100-level concourse, along with the building of a brand-new luxury club space. The venue will remain open at full capacity for all scheduled events during the construction. And President and CEO of Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, Keith Pelley, spoke earlier about the renovations. And what they have done is incredible, and it's going to be terrific for the fans, uh, it will prove to be a little bit challenging this summer for some of the concerts. Uh, but come next fall, for the uh, the beginning of the uh, the Raptors and the Leaf season, all the fans, all our partners, will see something completely different, far more fan friendly than ever before. The upgrades are part of a $350 million reimagination project, which was announced last year. 
Well, Toronto was not able to lock down a spot in the PWHL final in last night's game against Minnesota. There, Buderak feeds it down. Now a chance. Flaherty, she scores! Kristen Campbell's more than two-game-long playoff shutout streak was snapped early in the second period. Minnesota would add another in the 2-0 win. We're waiting to hear about the status of Toronto forward Natalie Spooner, who left the game into the third after a hard hit that sent her into the boards. Toronto still leads the best of five series, two games to one. Game four, that's tomorrow night in Minnesota. And joining us live ahead of that game is CSN Radio's Matt Cause. Okay, Matt, two big losses last night. Missed opportunity to sweep Minnesota and Natalie Spooner's injury. Is this something to be worried about? Yeah, absolutely it is. You saw that Toronto offensively had nothing going on last night. They had two shots in the first period, like 11 or 12 after two periods. In the third period, their one power play to try to get themselves back in the game, they only had two shots on net. They were sleepwalking, quite frankly, through a lot of that game offensively. Well, Natalie Spooner is the one player that can really turn that around on her own, just her playmaking. She led the league in goals. She led in points. And now we're all just refreshing the, our, in, our timelines to see about her injury. It looked like a pretty bad shoulder injury. She had to be helped off the ice and helped into the locker room. So we're all going to wait and see on that. And Minnesota, they... That team wasn't doing that well. They'd lost like seven in a row, their first playoff win, their first playoff goals. Uh, they were shut out in the first two games. So, yes, this was an opportunity lost by Toronto. And Matt, how does the team pull up its socks and step up their game if they're going to be without Natalie Spooner for a little while? You're going to just rely. We're not a fast is going to have to do more. Sarah Nurse as well. Like Toronto has a ton of talent. Yesterday was their first loss in nearly a month. They led in points in the PWHL. They had a comfortable lead over second, which I believe was Montreal. So it's going to be some of the other players just realizing whatever your whatever was expected of you, you're going to be a little bit more. And then defensively, you know, the one goal was a bad one. The other one on Kristen Campbell, the second goal, that was a mistake by her. She thought she had frozen the puck. She had it. It was still out there. And Minnesota is able to poke it through. Toronto should win. They're the better team defensively. They have more star talent. And uh, so they should win on Wednesday. But what you don't want to do is force a do-or-die game in Toronto. We know how that is for the hockey teams in this city. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Matt, you touched on this a little bit. Is Minnesota a real threat? Technic technically, no. I mean, Toronto, remember, they picked them. They got to pick who they were going to face in the playoffs. Would it be Minnesota or would it be Boston? They picked Minnesota. Minnesota only made the playoffs because on the final day of the regular season, Toronto beat Ottawa, which knocked Ottawa out of the playoffs, and Minnesota sort of got in through the back door. You know, and I don't want to do the cliche thing, like, well, you know, on any given night, but, you know, it, there's only two games left, so in that way they are a dangerous team. But if we're just looking at talent, Toronto has a lot more on it than Minnesota. Uh, game four tomorrow night. Yep. Uh, what are you watching for? I mean, really right now, I'm just watching everything between now and the start of the game if Natalie Spooner is going to be playing. If not, then I'm going to look at other players like who have won gold medals, who have done great things for Canada on the international stage. So obviously it's going to start with Sarah Nurse. And look for Kristen Campbell to bounce back before she gave up that goal in the second period. She had, she had two shutouts going in the first two games of the playoffs and played brilliantly down the stretch. Remember, Toronto ended the season winning the last four games in a row. Matt Cause, always good to hear from you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Matt. Uh, absolutely. Take care. And the Jays will go for a second straight win tonight against the Orioles. And now Ryan O'Hearn drives one to deep center. Shelton Varsho made an unbelievable catch in the fourth inning last night to rob the Orioles of a home run. He hit a homer of his own in the eighth as the Jays beat the Orioles 3-2 in extra innings in the opener. Chris Bassett is scheduled to start tonight. And thank you for watching CP24 Live at noon.